the crosscuts in our Angular applications. So a few words about me. Uh, I'm a freelancer currently changing education with Learn Capital. In my spare time, I'm doing a lot of open source. I'm also blogging, uh, teaching at Sofia University and hacker schools in Bulgaria. So this talk is going to be mostly about aspect-oriented programming, what actually is it, how we can take advantage of it, and what problems in the object-oriented programming it solves. However, in order to get better understanding of the problems behind the object-oriented programming, let's take a step back and look at some history. So why actually the object-oriented programming was invented? Initially, the requirements for our projects, they were quite simple, and uh, the results we had were quite simple as well. However, over time, the requirements for the project and the size of the projects we were building just started to explode, started to grow exponentially. And the tools we had, they were just not enough. So we were using uh, some primitive tools like C and Assembly, where we were working on very low level of details. For example, in Assembly, we were typing down individual instructions to the CPU. Uh, in C, both C and Assembly were managing the memory manually. And that was just not scaling that well. So what happened was that something more powerful was born. And that was the object-oriented programming, which brought its four main core powerful principles. And these principles are exactly abstraction, inheritance, encapsulation, and polymorphism. We're mostly going to talk about abstraction. So abstraction basically helps us handle complexity. Let's take a look at a simple example. So this user component module, we can think of it as uh, Angular 1.x service, or in order to be more modern, we can represent it as TypeScript class in the context of Angular 2. So this user, it has an ID, name, email, and a website. What if we want to store it into the database and there is a RESTful service which is responsible for management of this database and for receiving some requests from our application? So here is what we can do. We can simply implement a safe method to our user, which directly uses the XML HTTP, uh, XML HTTP requests API. And we can just open a POST request to the server and resolve a promise once the requests have been successfully completed, when we have status 200. Uh, yeah, this looks fine. Uh, how many of you have heard about SOLID? Cool. So SOLID, uh, basically, it is an acronym which contains a set of principles which, which helps us write better object-oriented software, which is more testable, uh, so as well as maintainable, and so on. So basically, it stays for a single responsibility principle, open-close principle, list of substitution, interface segregation, and dependency inversion. The dependency inversion principle states that high-level modules should not depend on low-level modules. But in our example, in our active record like client site implementation of the user service, our high level API, the high level user module was dependent on one of the lowest level APIs in the browser. We have the XML HTTP request uh, API. And so, so we violate this part of the principle. The dependency version principle also states that abstractions should not depend on details. But our user was dependent on the way we achieve restful communication with the server. So what we can do is to refactor our codes and include one more level of direction. This is going to help us uh, make our code more testable as well by allowing us to mock the HTTP module. So we can introduce this HTTP module, which has, in this case, two methods. The first one is get method, which accepts a URL and makes a HTTP get request to the service using the HTML5 fetch API. And the second method is a POST method, which does something similar, but this time we make a POST request to the service. We just pass the appropriate headers and the body of the request. And we get the JSON representation of the response in both cases. Okay, so far so good, but in order to enforce the separation of concerns even further, we can introduce a user finder. We might have some differences in the representation of the user's uh, server sites with uh, the representation with the format of the users in our application. So the user finder can handle these differences and refer reference uh, basically delegates the HTTP request to the HTTP service. So here is the user finder. Uh, it uses the dependency injection mechanism of Angular 2. So as uh, dependencies, it accepts the HTTP instance of the HTTP service and as well as the URL of the HTTP service. It has a single get method, 
which accepts an ID, the ID of the user we want to get, and we delegate the call to the HTTP service by making a GET request. And once we have response, which is already a JavaScript object, we just map it to the user representation in our application. So we can notice how we build different levels of abstraction, actually. We had our user on top, which is on highest level of abstraction since it models our domain. We have the user finder on lower level of abstraction, and the most lowest level of abstraction in our case, that's the HTTP service, which encapsulates the logic for communication with the RESTful service. Uh, a quite common case for optimization of the user experience could be to cache the users, and why not to local storage? So we can think of the users uh, as a service. It may change the data not that often. For example, the users might change every couple of months, and it doesn't make sense to send two requests for the same user. We can just send one request to the user and cache it on the disk, and on the next time the, this user is being request, requested, we can just take the copy of the user from the disk. So here is how we can do this. Uh, here is the logic which encapsulates uh, caching functionality. Basically, we try to find the user inside of local storage, and if we do find it, we just return, we just resolve a promise with it. Uh, otherwise, we make a new HTTP GET request to the service, and once we, the promise returned by the HTTP service has been resolved, uh, we just cache the user inside of local storage. And that's it. Another optimization we can, we can make is to add caching to our HTTP service. So the HTTP service could be used not only for getting users, but uh, as well as for fetching some, uh, for example, configuration options or other models. And uh, we can in introduce some in-memory caching here in order to not make, make two requests for the same data during a single session. So this is the HTTP service with caching included. We have some cache somewhere, and first we try to find out whether there is a response associated with this URL. If we find such response associated with this URL, we just resolve a promise with it. Otherwise, we make an explicit GET request using the fetch API, and right after the requests have been completed successfully, we just cache the response to the cache. And uh, we can notice how we can find uh, caching functionality on a couple of levels of abstraction. Basically, we can find it on the user finder level, which is on, uh, like somewhere in the middle in the levels of abstraction in our application. We can also find it on the most primitive API in, in our case, that's the HTTP API. So these things, they are known as cross-cutting concerns. And uh, they are quite a common problem in the object-oriented programming, actually. They just cross-cut the levels of abstraction in our applications uh, vertically. So we can find them in different levels of abstraction. Let's take a look at what part of the code inside of the implementation of our methods is not actually related to the purpose of the classes. So here is the user finder. It should delegate the code for HTTP GET request to the HTTP service, and right after that, it should map the response to our user representation. And that's the logic which is responsible for this. All the rest is, uh, encapsulates logging, lo logic about caching. And the same for the HTTP service here. So we have a uh, HTTP service which, needs, which is supposed to delegate the calls to the HTML5 fetch API, but here, like more than 50%, maybe more than 60% of the logic encapsulates uh, logic about caching, which is uh, unnecessary in our case. So the problems of these cross-cutting concerns is they cannot be cleanly decomposed and can result in either scattering or tangling of our code base. Uh, the caching is not the only problem. We, we also have things like logging, uh, also authorization, transaction management, and so on. And they just create some troubles. We just can't manage them that easily, because, well, the object range programming is just not powerful enough in this case. We can do some work around, for example, we can create some common abstractions, which encapsulate the, logging, the logic uh, for caching in our case. Uh, however, this, this way, by extending these common abstractions, we are going to create super tight coupling between these abstractions, the base classes, and the classes which extend them. So that's uh, not such a good practice, and well, that's just how it is. We just can, should deal with it somehow. So what happened was that the aspect range programming was invented, initially in Xerox, and uh, one of its most famous implementations is a uh, Java-based implementation in AspectJ. In this presentation, we are going to 
show a library uh, which implements the aspect range programming in the context of JavaScript. So what if we could just not care about anything and just remove all the cross-cutting concerns and extract them into separate modules? Well, we can just take our user finder and remove all the functionality which is uh, related to caching. And after refactoring, we have just much, much simpler code, which is responsible for making HTTP GET requests using the HTTP service and mapping the responses to the user's representation. The same for the HTTP service. We can just remove all the useless codes, which is connected to caching. And so that's our simple method on four lines of code. But how we can move all the cross-cutting concerns into separate modules? All right, so we have our functionality, which looks awesome, but it doesn't does what it is intended to do. So we can define something called cache aspect. And it is nothing more than an ECMAScript 2015 class. Basically, our, user, user, uh, our cache aspect, it has a couple of methods, like the before user finder get invocation. It's a very long name. You can basically name it however you want. It, I did it for, to be more descriptive. So the before user finder get invocation method, it accepts two arguments, a metadata and the ID of the user we want to get. As its name states, this method, it should be invoked just right before the get method of any instance of the user finder have been invoked. And inside of the method, what we do is just to delegate the call to a method called query cache with instance of the local storage cache and uh, reference to the method invocation. So this method.method .method is actually reference to the invocation of the get method of any instance of the user finder. We can manipulate this invocation somehow. And the other method, that's the after user finder get invocation. Basically, this uh, method does something quite similar, but this, this time it is going to be invoked right after the invocation of the get method of any instance of the user finder. And we delegate the call to a method called setCache. But how we can connect everything together? Well, so far we have our service and we have our cache aspect. But the JavaScript virtual machine is not aware when and exactly to invoke the methods of the cache aspect. And so we need to provide some hints for this. So we can take advantage of the ECMAScript 2016 decorators. Here, is, uh, here are some uh, decorators uh, defined within Aspect.js, the library we are going to take a look at. So let's take a look at the first one. Basically, we state that before each call of method which matches this regular expression here and is defined within a class called user finder, we want to invoke this piece of functionality. And we just do the same for the after user finder get invocation. We say that after each method, which starts with get and is defined within the user finder, we want to invoke the method just below the decorator. And so that's it. The only two methods left are query cache and set cache methods. Inside of the query cache method, we accept a reference to the cache, in our case, local storage cache in the user finder case, and reference to the method invocation reference to the get invocation of the method, to the invocation of the get method. Initially, we try to find whether there is a resource associated with the given ID passed as third argument, and if we do find such resource, we just prevent the method from further invocation. Basically, we can think of this method reference as a DOM event, and we do something like uh, stop propagation. And we just re resolve a promise with it. The set cache method is going to be invoked after the get method has been invoked, so we already have reference to the result returned by the, the method. So we know that this result is a promise, so we, use, we wait until it has been resolved, and once it has been resolved, we just, set, we just cache the response, and that's it. The only two tricky parts here are the ways uh, we use the reference we have to the method invocation with method.proceed and method.result. And when you are able to modularize your cross-cutting concerns this way, well, it's, it's that awesome. That's, that's how I felt when I did it for the first time. Yeah. So everything we saw so far is defined uh, in a library called aspect.js. Uh, it is published at 10 p.m. and uh, it's, you can find the source code at my GitHub. Uh, basically, 
it is still not production ready. Hopefully it is going to get production ready when Angular 2 get. So um, it is written in TypeScript. So you can use it also in ECMAScript 2016 because you need decorators for it. And let's review the magic behind it. Basically, initially we have our HTTP service and we have the cache aspect. It is in sales cult right now. What aspect.js does is to combine both definitions in a defi another definition, patched definition of your initial service, and we are going to override the get method of our HTTP service this way. And the new definition initially is going to invoke the, after, the before method of the cache aspect. Right after that, we are going to invoke the original method of the get uh, of the HTTP service, and in the end, we are going to invoke the after method of the cache aspect uh, with the appropriate metadata, and that's it. Basically, it's called, it's known as uh, proxy-based aspect-oriented programming, and it is very widely used in the world of Java, in Spring, for example. But what about Angular 1.x? What if uh, you, are, you prefer to use Angular 1.x? Well, you can still use aspect.js, However, you will need a transpiler uh, for, in order to transpile your code from TypeScript to uh, ECMAScript 5 or from ECMAScript 2016 to ECMAScript 5. But what if you don't want to use such intermediate step? Well, there is, uh, I developed a library called uh, Angular AOP a couple of years ago. It is much more stable compared to Angular, uh, to AspectJS. It has some tests, continuous integration, and uh, Gitter channel for support. So you can give it a try. And uh, yeah, I want to finish the slides with a quote from Ryan Singer, uh, who says that so much complexity in software comes from trying to make one thing do two things. And that's exactly what we tried to avoid here uh, by, ex by extracting the cross-cutting concerns into separate modules. And there is something I want to announce. So with Pact, uh, we are working on a book called Switching to Angular 2. Uh, so it's, yeah, that's the cover now. Uh, it got, it's going to be so awesome that uh, it's awesome that it didn't fit in the toy, so. Uh, it should be released by the beginning of the next year, and uh, yeah, that's it. If you have any questions about uh, the aspect range programming in Angular and in JavaScript in general, or about switching to Angular, you can find me in the M M A, A, M -A, session, M -A room after that. Thank you very much for your attention.